All right, you good to go. Uh, the year was 1994. I remember when I first went to YA. I just entered California Youth Authority at 13. I was sent down south to Nellis, school for boys down there in Whittier, California, or Norwalk, I think it was, one of the two. My first day there, we get off the bus. We go in the back. And well, there's a dorm setting with a whole bunch of beds on both sides. And people ask me, well, first of all, they ask, where are you from? So I tell them, I'm from West Oakland. So being from down south, they never heard of West Oakland. So they like, man, where is that at? I'm like, man, it's in the Bay Area. They're like, where? Well, up north? I'm like, yeah. So they're like, what, you a northerner? I'm like, man, I'm from up north. I get this. So I start getting jumped. So every day being down south from being from up north, they figured that they jump on a brother. So I came in there really not knowing how to really fight that much as well as I wanted to. So every single day I was holding my skills. I made sure that I was never going out. So every time I had a problem with somebody and they said something, I would just take off first. See, that became my motto over a period of time. The reason I've never been stabbed, the reason I've never been shot, is because if I think we have a problem, I'm known to get off first. So I'm there for a while, and I'm starting to learn. I'm starting to search for a family. I have nobody. I'm on my own, trying to figure out how I'm going to survive in the, in the wolf's den with rabbit skin on me. And I learned one thing. I learned that sometimes your family is not always related to you by blood. Sometimes relations can be friends. Sometimes your friends can be closer to you than family. So I found, slowly found a bunch of my homies that were bloody waters. That's the buds and the Bay Area cats mixed together. And we start running. And I start learning a lot of things. I wasn't too much focused on, you know, the gang banging. I'm not a gang member, so I really wasn't focused on that. My mind was always been on trying to be knowledgeable and, and make my mind state more strong. So I met this guy who said he was a God body. I asked him, hey, bro, what, what, what the hell you mean you are a God body? What does that mean? So he told me, he said, there's 85% of the world that's deaf, dumb, and blind. They believe everything that's on TV. They don't pay attention to nothing. And they walk around with blinders on their eyes. Then you have 10% of the world. 10% of the world, of 7 billion people, rule the world. How is that possible? They own the banks. They own TV stations. They own everything. They control what you see, what you read, what you hear. Everything that goes on, they control. That's crazy. And then you have us, the poor righteous teachers, the last 5%. Our job is to understand fully the concept of everything in this world, but to really understand and look at it from a different view. As a poor righteous teacher, my job is to each one teach one, meaning that each person, meaning that each person that I run into, I am to teach them something, and then they are to take it and give it to the next person, the next person, and the next person. So as I start doing that, I start getting more grounded into my Africanism. I start realizing that as an Afro Asiatic man who came from the Horn of Africa in Egypt, I learned that we are the first men. And that God is only a view of who you really are. You are your own God. It's in the Bible or whatever those books are. They tell you that God made you in his own image. Then you must be a God. Because if a monkey makes a monkey, he's a what? A monkey. If a duck has a duck, it's a duck. So if God made you in his own image, there's only one thing that you can be. You can only be a God. That does not mean that you're the higher power. That just truly means that you are in control of oneself. You rule your own domain. You rule your own world. You rule your own life. So I learned that. I started living by that. I started setting my own boundaries, looking at things different. Fuck listening to the man and the rules and regulations. Who is that to say that I, who I killed was wrong? That's crazy. In my mind, it wasn't wrong because I had I had reasonableness to do it. I had a reason to do it. Yeah, it was retribution. Yeah, it was retaliation. But at the same time, you took all that I had from me. I slowly started to see things as a lost cause. I learned that at 13 years old, when you tell somebody that they'll never get out until they're 21 or 25, that seems like an eternity. What do I have to program for? Nothing. What do I have to live for? Nothing. You took that away before you put me in jail. Now here it is. I'm around the worst of the worst of the worst, and you want me to still struggle to survive? 
But at the same time, now you like, this Nick. It's wrong. You can't do it. How am I wrong for killing? But the government's not wrong for giving you life in prison or giving you the electric share. Oh, it's okay. It's not okay for me to kill, but it's okay for you to kill me. Mm. That doesn't make any type of sense. So when I, as I started getting older, I started learning everything that I can. I started believing in the, the, the lost concept or the false cause and the master race of, oh, if you just educate yourself and learn a trade, when you get out, everything's going to be all fine. I'm sorry to be the one first one to tell you that's a fucking lie. I can remember that as I shifted through why eight long years, seven years, 11 months, and 10 days I was there. The day that I got out the day before my 21st birthday, I looked at it as the first day of the rest of my life. Little did I know that your past forges your future, therefore your past is the past. It does make your life. Your life cannot start on one day. It started from the day that you were given birth because your past is your future. Therefore, I learned. When I got out, I started working for a place called ADT Special Promotions Department. I started selling uh, home security systems. I was working there for about six months. I made, you know, employee of the month two or three times. And then one day, my boss just called me in. And he said, hey, look, I got to tell you something, man. In order for you to work here, you must have a guards card, which means that you have a permit to carry a gun. And we did a live scan and ran your, your uh, prints to the FI, FBI database, and we see that you got two murders as you. I'm sorry, uh, we can't let you can't let you work here anymore. So I got fired. As I was walking home, I seen a, a, a sign that was at the armory recruiter's place, and it said, "Signing bonus ten thousand ten thousand dollars. These soldiers for 9/11." Now, mind you, this is 2001, right after the 9/11 incident. This is about about March, April 2002. So I walk in the army recruiter office, and I tell him, "Yeah, man, I'm interested in signing up." So he gives me the aptitude test. He goes through the little, all the little background and stuff. He says, come back tomorrow. We're going to run your name. I say, okay. So I come back the next day, and he says, oh, I'm sorry. We can't uh, take you to the Army. Uh, it seemed like you got two murders as a youth. I stopped, and I realized something in life. That's stupid. So you mean to tell me that you're going to send Willie really light, light, light guy over here to war who's never been under live fire in his life. He ain't never grew up in the ghetto. He probably ain't never even shot a fucking gun. You're going to send them to Iraq to go get killed. But people who's killed motherfuckers, people who live this way, people who see it every day, people who's not going to freeze under pressure, you won't send me over there? So basically what you're telling me is that I'm not shit. My life means nothing. If I can't get a job because I have a record, then how can I support myself? But yet, if I do crime, you lock me up. See, I learned right then and there that parole in the, in the system it's nothing but a revolving door for a warehouse to be able to be brought here to make them their eighty five to hundred twenty five thousand dollars a year per inmate. It's crazy. You can't find homes for the homeless people out there. You can't feed the homeless, but you can give money to other countries after you go tear them down. You can feed somebody else that's homeless and you can house everybody else, but you can't house people over here. Why? Because the first thing you want to do is lock them up so you can get paid off. That's for so I started selling dope. The only thing I had to do. So I figured, okay, you know, I start selling dope. Uh, you know, what's the harm in that? You know, uh, I'm giving dope to the dope. They're gonna get, if they don't get it from me, they're going to get it from somebody else. And I slowly started to see the fault in that. I started doing insurance fraud. 2004, I got locked in my first time in prison. I knew I was going to come. I just didn't know it was going to be then. First days in prison, I learned. I started sitting back watching things. I have uncles and cousins and brothers who was in prison that were all under BGF. So, as a black, understanding what a God body was and being in touch with my blackness and my roots, I asked the homie one day, I said, hey, comrade, why you lace me up on what this BGF shit is about? And he sat me down. And he told me the story of George Lester Jackson, a man who was an advocate for blacks while we were in jail. Uh, old Panther. He had the off branch of the Black Panthers. And see, I had grew up in West Oakland, which is where the Black Panthers were at a point in time. So I had already knew about Hugo, Hugo Pinnell. I knew about Huey P. Newton. I knew about Geronimo Pratt and George Jackson, even though he was from L.A. So when I started listening to the things and the struggles and the strife and the, and the strife that we go through, I was too interested. Finally, they gave me my oath. 
that's when I took my oath, I realized that this is more serious than anything. To violate this oath, it means death, and death becomes one. So I started to slowly embrace my Jama people and realizing that as a family, I am now accepted. I now have a family. I can depend on my folks, even though they're revolutionists. It would be a struggle. If we get into a riot, I know I can depend on not having to watch my back because I know that my back will always be watched either by my brothers or by the Northern Brown brothers because they are our allies. It was black and brown everywhere I went. So when I start tearing shit up, see, as BGF, we have one rule, one of our own rules in engaging in war, and that's it's a hands-on policy. So do the Northern Brown brothers. So that's why we click up and we, we function with them so well. It's because we all understand the strifes and the struggles that we go through. And we realize that if in a situation of violence, if it's not worth killing over, definitely not worth fighting over. Therefore, when it's time to go, we use weapons. We don't use hands. Why would I want to fight you and then the next day I have to fight you again? The next day I have to fight you again and the next day I have to fight you again. And I can just stab holes in you and I don't ever have to see you again. So I slowly start learning. I slowly start realizing. I slowly start structuring myself. I start working out. I start structuring my mind. Because I learned one very important thing my big homie had told me one day. He said, you can work your body out as long as you want to. You can be the most important and most biggest strong soldier in the world. But the problem is, if your mind is not structured, your body means nothing. See, when you ask a human being how many eyes they have, normally you're going to get the answer of two. The thing is, you have three eyes. You have two eyes that you see with and one that you completely understand and bring clarity with. That third eye is your brain. It's the most important muscle in the body. It's the strongest muscle in the body. It helps you understand things instead of just see things. One can have knowledge, but what is real knowledge without understanding and, and wisdom? It's nothing. To use that knowledge Knowledge repetitively to structure your wisdom brings understanding. And I slowly started to learn that as time grows on, that I can structure my own mind to reform itself and not believe in these bullshit laws that America gives you, the bullshit roads that America gives you. It hurt me on the past because in why you have to do something. I mean, in, the, in prison, you have to follow by a certain set of rules. And if you don't, they label you an outlaw and they throw you in the shoe. See, I was sent to the shoe for stabbing the police on my first fight. My first fight, I was wound up getting in a fight. The police put their hand on me, and I blanked out due to my PTSD issues, and I wound up stabbing the police. So I was sent to the, I was sent to the shoe for battery on a peace officer. I thank you guys once again for listening. I'll be back soon with another... Uh,